Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for attending ICEP Lebanon's webinar today. I would also like to thank Wadi Amalou for giving us his time to present an important topic in the field of prevention. Wadi Amalou is currently a program officer at UNODC. He holds a PhD in mental health and drug addiction epidemiology from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. He first worked in Lebanon in 1998 on a joint program between the civil society and the government on assessing the drug situation and orienting the national drug demand reduction strategy. Wadia joined UNODC in 2005, based in the regional office for MENA in Cairo, Egypt. His first role was a regional epidemi epidemiologist and drug demand reduction advisor. Since 2010, he assumed the post of Global Program Coordinator in the Drug Prevention and Health Branch of UNODC, headquartered in Vienna. His Global Program is the main operational arm used by UNODC in promoting evidence-based prevention interventions and policies. His role is to develop, pilot, and assess, and assess the impact of family skills responses in preventing drug use, crime, and violence, as well as life skills, education responses in schools and sports settings. A contributor to the Inspire, Inspire Interagency Initiative to End Violence Against, Against Children and the UNODC WHO International Standards on Drug, drug Use Prevention, and has several publications in the field of drug demand reduction. In today's webinar, Wadia will help us understand the value of evidence-based family skills for substance use prevention and other negative social outcomes, including violence and poor mental health, especially in the context of COVID-19. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so please submit your questions in the questions box. I will now give the floor to Wadia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noor, for this lovely introduction. And um, I should start by thanking you for the invite. I know this is a third in a series of presentation that um, ISAP Lebanon chapter is doing. But um, given that this is the first time I'm joining you, I know my chief, Giovanna, joined you on the first webinar. I need to tell you uh, congratulations on this new initiative as a mentor and uh, Arabia as well as for the launch of ISAP uh, Lebanon chapter. It means a lot to me, um, not only as a person working on prevention, but probably also as a Lebanese. So um, I also need to pass a small shout out for um, Jeff Lee, who also mentioned the lovely collaboration we have with Mentor, as well as Mentor Arabia in the beginning. Um, Jeff is a person that we fully respect and uh, we really appreciate and he's uh, one of the pillars of prevention that we um, we really enjoy working with on, on more than one level. So uh, and as well I cannot but say that uh, with the team of ISAP in general uh, we enjoy a beautiful relationship. Um, Olivia, um, um, Olivia, um, well, I mean, everybody in, in, in the group, um, as well as Matter Arabia, we really enjoy working with all of you. Um, so with that, just small introduction, I'm just grateful for being with you. So with that being said, um, I'm going to talk about family skills for prevention of substance use, mental health, and violence for drug for development. But I will try to also, given that the current situation we live in, focus in terms of what can we do under COVID-19 and what's available for all of us really. Uh, I'm a parent myself in terms of parenting skills under COVID-19. So I'll try to tie in a bit the conversation that happened so far. Giovanna, aside being the chief of the section, is also one of the driving engines that sort of materialized the international standards on drug use prevention. And this is a core starting ground before I move to anything when I talk about family skills prevention to understand the core content of why the prevention standards exist and what sort of key messages are we targeting under the prevention standards. Um, the 2018 latest version of uh, second edition of the standards you see are done jointly with WHO. In a nutshell, Giovanna mentioned the fact that the prevention standard is a three-day presentation. She presented in 40 minutes. I'm going to summarize it in two. 
um, essentially prevention is science. We're trying to divert the thinking of policymakers when they think in terms of how to address prevention in a science manner, rather than focusing on the drug as a problem, to focus on the developing individual in different ages of development, what the individual needs to achieve in a healthy and safe way the milestone of development at that specific age, both from an individual resilience as well as from the surrounding environment support, the institutions around. At different ages, different institutions play a role that help the child. Maybe the family, the school, the community, other sort of influential institutions. So basically focusing on the fact that awareness raising is, 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 not, is good, but it's not enough. Um, the situation is deeper than actually saying yes or no for substances. The situation requires prevention programs based on science that really help the child achieve the intellectual, language, cognitive, emotional, and social competency that are needed at every single age of development, from birth onward, to help the child resist engaging in risky behavior. And that's core in terms of what I'm going to mention. For us, substance use is the result of a vulnerability framework that you see in front of you now. Every single person have things under their skin, have vulnerabilities that are linked to the genes, to the character, to how the person reacts with stress. Maybe in the same family, you see three kids that have you know, similar genes, but they have different characters, different sensation seeking, different level of aggressiveness or reactivity to stress, different neurological development. All of these are individual characteristics, but the individual doesn't live in vacuum. These interact with an environment that can accentuate or attenuate these vulnerabilities. The family, the school, the peers are the micro level uh, level um, environment that interact with that individual. And of course, these family, the school, and the peer exist in a larger community where there might be violence, there might be conflict, there might be war, post conflict, poor socioeconomic status, uh, um, refugee settings, um, everything. All of these play a role in an interactive role that changes in the level of susceptibility and vulnerability of the child and you can appreciate at different ages of development and these vulnerabilities that we try to address help in preventing substance use but you can appreciate as well when we think in that perspective we're not only preventing substance use you're preventing many other social and health outcomes and this is the beauty of working under the uh, prevention standards and that's why the prevention standards you will see stretches the thinking of the policymakers that prevention can start from infancy from birth actually there are even interventions that are good during the pregnancy period of the mother to address so that it prevents the child before birth onward to be at risk in terms of substance use at a later age that's how different how how, how big the shift of paradigm we're talking about Peer, later on, Peer van der Kreeft, a person that we also fully respect when it comes to specifically socio-emotional learning programs and life skills programs in schools, one of the pillars of a program called Unplugged that I'm sure he presented uh, last time, but also uh, in the field of prevention. Now he's the president of the European Union Society of Prevention Research, so we can think in terms of the thinking ground. Peer talked a lot in terms of how they can build personal resilience in the child through life and social skills in schools but i'm sure he talked in terms of also how these uh, personal and social skills can be also applied in institution out of school peer was one of the core people that helped us as you know develop a program called line up live up which is a program that uh, work with sport coaches actually to promote these personal and social skills in sports settings under the logic that sometimes the vulnerable youth that we want to reach are not necessarily in schools, but we might reach them in other settings. What I'm going to talk about is the role that goes beyond personal resilience, but how can the family as a social institution, as a child, support these children? So 
for us, family is key. It's a social institution. Of course, the school is an important institution, a very, very supportive institution. But at the end of the day, the teacher is a, is a, is a person that has a transactional time with a child of a year, maybe two. Family, on the other hand, when family skills exist, these people within that institution, aside the fact that they are much smaller in number, so the interactivity might be more appreciated, but these people also share something beyond just being a teacher and a student. These people share genes, share a history, and share a future together. So for us, family as an institution can be very influential when it comes to prevention programming. So what do we mean by family skills? healthy parenting. Healthy parenting is an essential component of early development. And we're talking about a social institution now, the family, that can provide a layer of child adjustment over and beyond the individual resilience that a child can acquire. And this is where you appreciate how different programs can be supplementary and complementary. So individual resilience are important, but having a layer beyond these individual resilience is very important and we're not talking because i'm from the office on drugs and crime of parents really being police officers in the house and really monitoring if the children are using drugs or not no we're just talking about the transactional relationship between the parents and their children um the parenting skills how is there inconsistent parenting because we know that this is a predictive of later poor outcome is this harsh aggressive parenting that might be altered. Um, you know, all of these, the communication, the bonding, the relationship between these individuals, because that sort of layering that might have different effect at different ages of development of the child is related not only for drug use, but to poor school attainment, to delinquency, to poor mental health. So basically parents and, and these parents as well are not you know, challenged by the fact that they have a child of a specific age, but they might be living in different circumstances and their parenting skills might be might uh, might need a different level of support depending on the context that they're living. Of course, if I have a teenager, I'm a, as a parent, I'm challenged in terms of how to raise a teenager. But if I'm a, a parent that's raising a teenager in a conflict setting or in a refugee setting, I have additional changes that have to be accounted for. But in general context, what we're working is for is working with families to support sustainable development and i'm sure probably as we go through this you will appreciate why that same program is linked to more than one sustainable development goal to health which makes sense for us we're coming in supporting um, the target on on supportive of prevention for um, preventing drug use supporting the drug use um, uh, target 3.5 but also education is improved uh, sdg 16 particularly SDG 16.2 on preventing violence is supported and gender equality. Family skills, what are they? These are programs that really sort of works with, with families to help change the communication, the trust, the problem solving skills, the conflict resolution that exists between parents and their children in different age groups and in different cultural settings. So they offer a time where parents and children reflect and spend positive time together. And they strengthen the bonding and attachment between the two. So a core component of this program is that they focus on the relationship and behavior change and require practice for a skill. Okay. So the prevention standard talks about specific recommendations in terms of what function, regardless of the brand of the parenting skills program or a family skills program that you're using, there's a common ground that makes these programs successful. They should be organized in a fun, easy and appealing way for everybody to participate because, I mean, you can imagine um, dry lectures when inviting parents come, we want to give you a lecture of how to be a parent are difficult. So basically, the more appealing they are uh, in terms of fun exercises, the retention rate is higher. And of course, so which means that the program are more effective because parents engage more in the program. They should be delivered by trained individuals. But luckily for us, there are many programs that have been designed and been documented to show a positive effect 
with the facilitators, the people passing on that knowledge, don't have a formal qualification as a psychologist or an advanced degree, which is important for us as United Nations, because we work in countries that are low middle income in most cases, and an infrastructure of you know, training 50 psychologists is sometimes a commodity that does not exist. There should be a series of, section, of sessions, are preferred, of course, because you're building a parenting skill, um, you know, a, a function of a family. Um, it's not only one skill, there is a series of things that has to be established. And um, there are lots of parenting programs, of course. But in many cases, it's important to notice that it's the parent that some needs to change. So some parents come in for parenting programs thinking like, you know, my I have a challenge with my child, how can I change that thing in my child? But in most cases, it's the parent that needs to change, you know, the parenting, right? And the other element of this is like, you know, so basically some parenting programs do function, but sometimes when the parent change and goes back to the family, if the child is not part of this program, the, the 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 application the child resists that change of I'm I'm used to my parent this way and my I've, I feel my my parent has changed but when you engage the whole family in the program the odds of the child accepting that change in the family is higher so that's why I mean this in my brain I try to differentiate between parenting programs and, and family skills program where the whole family is part of the program being put in place for sure what we know is that what does not work are programs that undermine parents' authority, programs that are just lectures, and provide information about drugs for parents, right? Because I'm talking about the prevention standards at the end of the day, the prevention standards for drug use, as we know, DC. And if the focus is exclusively on the child, and poor training of staff is usually an element that makes programs don't work. But what we know also from the prevention standards is that these programs are effective for both boys and girls which is not the same for all programs of effectiveness of prevention. The gender sensitivity of these programs is a key element that made us more encouraged to prioritize these programs as well in our uh, fieldwork. Another note to keep in mind, which is something I hinted to before, when we talk about prevention, there are several layers of prevention. What I'm talking about is primary prevention, which means a problem does not exist, and I want to avoid it from existing, you know, from occurring in the first place. That's my main goal. Or in the case of substance use, if I'm not going to completely abolish it from existing, at least delay its, um, you know, its onset to a much later age, because we know when it comes to substance use, the earlier you start using substances, the, the odds of you passing from just casual substance use to kind of substance use uh, that have it's associated with disorders is higher. So, but I'm talking primary prevention, preventing the problem from happening. And in that context, there are programs that are universal, that are for everyone, regardless of the level of risk you can give it to. Imagine you're going to a classroom and you have kids living in a different, coming in from different communities that have different problems, sitting in a room, and you have the same program given, and, and at the same time you have kids from, you know, more privileged families sitting in the room. You're giving one program for everyone. That's a universal program. But there are selective programs. These are programs that are given for a group of people, but are at higher vulnerability than the rest of the population. Assuming, for example, I'll give you an example. You go to classrooms or to schools that are in rural areas or, or areas that are catering more for um, refugee families. So you understand, you know, you're giving this program in that setting for everyone, but you understand that that community is at a higher level of vulnerability than the average community that you actually work with. And there are programs at the indicated level, and these are programs that are tailored for individuals that are starting to show symptomatic um, problems. Um, so basically, uh, early signs of aggressive behavior, um, mental health issues are then identified somehow, and these require a prevention that is more targeted uh, at, at, at that individual vulnerability uh, more than on a group basis. What I'm going to talk more are mostly on the universal selective uh, sort of level of prevention. One common obstacle that we always face when we talk about moving a program, transferring that knowledge from one country to the other is like our families don't like to discuss drug issues. And our families are different than the families where the evidence of that programs come from. Common thing. 
what we usually try to engage with as countries where we're working is to make them understand that these programs do not discuss drugs. These programs just talk about family functioning. They help your family function in a better way. And that's why you will love these programs because you will appreciate it, it, it eases up a lot of issues in your family. And the drug issue is not a necessary component. And in most cases, it does not even exist in these programs. And the other element is like, you're not different than any other family because yes, culturally speaking, the family might function a different way in that setting versus the other. But if you see it from a perspective of a child at a certain age of development, what that child needs at that age of development from his or her caregivers is the same. That, what, that nurturing element that is needed at that age, regardless of your race, of your culture, of whatever, is, is for you to, as, to, to embrace you as, a, as an institution around you to reach the milestone that you need to pass from that age to the other age is universal. And that's the core component that we keep in our family skills program that is key in the transfer of knowledge and the science of it. Another proof for that is like we are working in so many countries. I mean, there are 34 countries engaged with us in terms of family skills. And you can appreciate just by reading the list, the diversity of the culture, the races that exist in terms of these programs and the effectiveness of these programs are only influences by the level of vulnerability that the family is living in in these different contexts. But universally speaking, these programs have, doc have documented effectiveness in terms of work. Early on, we used to transfer evidence-based programs, and we continue to do so. Evidence-based program in the sense of these programs are copyrighted to institutions that have researched for a long period of time and transfer that knowledge to the countries that are there to document. You know, Giovanna talked about the prevention standards. Prevention standards work at the top-down level. So you talk to policymakers to change their vision of what works so that service providers can have the chance of experiencing evidence-based programs. At the same time that this is happening, this top-down modality, we're working bottom-up by piloting programs at the service providers level and showcasing that these programs make a difference and, and, and are effective and, and, and are practical in terms of implementation in these countries so that at the top level, so bottom-up, at the top level, this policymaker understand that we're, this is not science fiction, that works in their country. So that's the element I'm going to talk to, this bottom-up approach that really have been documented in so many different countries in terms of family skills. And there are lots of publications that we have helped support because the culture of science in many of the countries also needed support. And we documented that these programs work. And you can see just from the title, you know, following up in terms of effectiveness of these programs on substance use require long follow-up. But maybe there are other indicators that these same programs support, for example, violence, that we showcase at a much earlier uh, stage. And, 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 and you will appreciate there are lots of publications from different countries, including, for example, in Panama, where the program has been documented to change the culture of violence prevention. That's the SFP, Sending the Family Program 10 to 14, piloting in Panama that was introduced for us under a drug prevention agenda, changed the way the policymakers are thinking about the culture of violence prevention many publications are issued but what we faced is that while this program is very effective and transferable but at the end of the day these programs have been developed in high income countries where the infrastructure that sort of where these programs can be implemented is different than the infrastructure that exists in the countries where we are working as united nations something as simple as the availability of electricity I come from Lebanon. I appreciate that even in Lebanon, but there are worse countries than that. So basically, there are programs that are designed in such a way where we have to showcase, for example, a, a video or through a DVD player where there's a problem in the family and then you pause it and you start discussing. First of all, the production of these videos, change of faces, change of dialect is, is, is a cost, is a burden on, on some countries. But then sometimes having the electricity to play the video is basically the experience of the facilitators is sometimes a, an impediment. The cost of the materials from production, um, royalty, copyright fees, all of these are impediments in low income country, which help us more think a step forward, especially in countries that have already been sensitized and they are interested to move to scale. 
how can we help them move these programs to scale? And this is where we started developing our own open source family squares programs. I'm going to talk about two that are essential for us. One is the Strong Family Program, which is a program designed for family living in stressful settings. Okay, so it's like focused a lot on stress. We talk about humanitarian settings or refugee settings or um, post-conflict settings or maybe just pure resource, you know, low infrastructure uh, in terms of resource settings, right? So parents are under stress. And Family United is a universal program, but is un for any family, right? Uh, not necessarily living in stress, but it is designed for countries that are low income. So basically, it is a low cost program. The Strong Families program is a program that we thank the USINL in terms of, you know, it, you know, designing it and, and starting to the first place because, um, you know, it was designed and first piloted in Afghanistan with the help of USINL. But since then, it has moved to different countries with the support of other donors. As I said, it's for challenge settings. It improves parenting skill and child well-being and uh, mental health of the family. And it's for families that have kids between the ages of eight and 15. It's very light touch. It's really two sessions and a half, not three sessions, because the first session is only for caregivers, right? For one hour. And the other two sessions, the whole family comes in. Um, yeah, I'm just checking if, okay. So the, whole, the, the next two sessions, the whole family comes in. Um, the sessions are designed in such a way, in the session when the whole family comes in, um, uh, facilitators go with the caregivers to one room and talk about caregiver skills, really. And in parallel, there will be another facilitators working with the children on children-focused skills. And then the second part of the hour, the whole family comes together and they practice what they've learned together. And the same thing in session three. So two sessions with the entire families are implicated and one session only the caregivers. And what do we talk about? In the caregiver sessions, the topics are you explore parent challenges, develop ways of better deal with stress as a parent, um, how to value both love and limits. So how can I be, in, again, I don't want to be a dictator in my family, but I don't want to be too permissive. Where can I draw that limit in terms of making the child respect the rules without being mean, like, you know, enforcing it by itself. But respecting the rule is different than enforcing the rule. Um, how can I listen to my child? Uh, how can I um, encourage good behavior and discourage misbehavior without being aggressive as a parent? And the child session, how to deal with stress, explore rules and responsibility, and think about future goals. You know, what do I aspire to be when I grow up? And in the family session, you practice things interactively. Positive communication, relief techniques, and, and family values, um, you know, you start discussing it within the family, having a positive communication. These are some photos from the field. For example, these are kids working together in terms of acquainting each other in the child session. This is a photo from Afghanistan. I thought maybe it's nice to see. There are smiling faces of children that uh, in Afghanistan. It's not always a morbid photo that really aspire for a better future. This is a photo from um, Dominican Republic where um, the family is coming together, you will see on the right side, the parents, and on the left side, their respective children. So they're facing their children. And there's a thermometer in between where, you know, situations are being given to, um, for the child. Uh, and then that situation describes that the mother is going through something. And the child has to guess the level of stress that the mother, so first of all, the mother would tell, determine while the child is turning his or her back, how much stressful she feels under that circumstance. And then the child turns around and the child is telling, okay, in that scenario that we described, how much do you think your parent is stressed um, under that scenario? And the, and the child tried to guess what the parent, what the parent stood on that thermometer. And then if, the, if they're close, it's fine. If they're different, then they start discussing and, and they verify a reverse role. So the parents also has to guess the stress of the child and vice versa. And that sort of thing makes the child appreciate the stress of the parent. The parent appreciate the stress of the child and, the ch and both the child and the parent start communicating in terms of discussing these valuable issues more than how was your day? Fine. Not your, it goes beyond in terms of a quality discussion. That's another example from Iran where there's like reaching your dreams, where parents and children sort of work together in terms of they're given a scenario uh, as a parent. And then that scenario will determine whether they are a good parent or they have poor parenting skills. 
if they are a good parent, they move a step forward. If they're a bad parent, they move backward. It's not like they, but the scenario. And then the child will, would hear that scenario and see if the parenting is moving forward or not. But at the same time, the children are given scenarios as well. And in terms of respecting the rules or not respecting the rules, and they appreciate if it's if they are moving, if they if the, if the parent move uh, with the children independently, meaning that uh, the the child the, if the scenario is positive, the mom move forward, but the child stays in the back, and the child sees the scenario. If the scenario of the child is positive, then the child moves with the parent. Anyway, long story short, this is a story where like they will start to appreciate that they both have to work positively in order to reach the last line on that game where they reach their dream, which is their, 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 their goal. And it's not only the parent, but the parent has to work with the child of being positive. So that's the sort of exercises that they play together. This is a photo from the Philippines as well, where they have practiced strong family outdoors in the nature. So it seems simple. But does it change? So we have tested that program first in Afghanistan and then on Afghan refugees that are stranded in Serbia on their way transitioning to Europe. You can appreciate both you are internally displaced and you're living in a conflict setting or you are already a refugee, the level of parenting stress that you are living with. So overall, there was about 100 families, 75 in Afghanistan and about 25 in, in Serbia. And then uh, these parents, these families went through strong families and then they were tested at three time points, just before the intervention, two weeks before that brief intervention and six weeks later. And we already can see that both in Afghanistan and in, in Afghan stranded in refugee camps, when it comes to a scale, which is the strength and difficulty questionnaire, which is a, a, a test that really measures the level of difficulty the child go through uh, per the parent assessment, on different sort of subdomains, emotional, uh, hyperactivity, and other sort of domains. Overall, we get a score in terms of difficulty that the parent feel that is nor uh, normalized. So it, the more you move to the red zone, you are you have a child that is, has a clinical significance of, of problems, you know. And the more you move to the green, you're more a uh, normalized child. You will appreciate on average where the children were in both communities and how they have improved over time, both if they are in Afghanistan or they are refugees stranded in Serbia, closer to the normalized level through that just brief intervention. And this is where we have focused on the subgroup of kids, whether in Afghanistan or in Serbia, the subgroup of kids that the parents rated in the red zone. Okay, what about these kids specifically? They were like, they had, you see, because you're very high when you are between 20 and 40. So the kids that were on the average around 21 um, at baseline, how much they have improved over time as well. So basically it works really well for the parents that have the most challenge with their children. And of course we have tested them for boys or, or versus girls and you can see two parallel lines running really in, in parallel. So basically it helps both. And the publication is available for you to read in BMC Public Health in terms of its level of effectiveness. So. The program works, right? Of course, there are families that have significant problems, clinical problems, where you know there is maybe aggressiveness to the child has PTSD that require more intensive work. But as a basic sort of basic need of skills, that program seems to reflect a positive effectiveness. It's available in many languages. Moving into refugees, and I'm going to focus a bit more on it because their number, unfortunately, is increasing. So there's 1.5 billion people in the world that are experiencing conflict and humanitarian challenges. One in every 113 people in the world is a refugee as we speak. It's not a small community. And, but you know, it remains the fact that primary caregiver um, are a protective shield. You know, there is no other social institution around the child than the parents. And I know in certain instances, these parents, you know, the children don't have them. But I mean, if they exist, they are the only source of caregiving really uh, in, in, uh, for war stress. So that interactivity is very important in this setting uh, as, a, as a front line of defense. But also we have to appreciate the fact that, you know, having a program as basic as strong families, you know, even if it's three sessions, is complicated in situation where the parents and the families really cannot go and travel. I mean, there's a war zone, there are refugee camps. So accessing them even through these interactive sessions might be complicated. So 
coincidentally, Manchester University was working on distributing leaflets for refugee families, Syrian refugees, really, in Turkey uh, in a creative way and documenting that these programs are at least, you know, helping a bit. They're not solving the problem, but they're helping a bit the families. And then later on, they started working on a booklet, which is a bit more detailed version of um, the leaflet where the parents can read and learn more about this case than just briefly. And at the same time, working on strong families. So we started working together. And this is where, for example, creatively, Manchester University was actually for the Syrian refugees that are stranded in Turkey, they worked with the bakery and they were putting these parenting sheets uh, with the bakery, asking them to just put these sheets inside the bread bags that are distributed in the community there. And the parents were reading them. And you will see a white paper and a blue paper. The white paper is actually the tips. And the blue paper is actually a questionnaire where they were asking them, how useful are these tips for you? I mean, they had the response rate of almost 70% uh, appreciative of these facts. And you will see that, um, you know, how much they have appreciated the usefulness of these leaflets. That by itself will tell you in terms of sometimes just nudging the parents. And I will see it in more detail next in terms of nudging the parents, how, how useful that is. So the next level was the booklet. This is the booklet in terms of caregiving for children through conflict and displacement where we started working together and we have piloted that in Nablus in Palestine. And that publication is there and you will see that, you know, there were a group of parents that took the program and another was as a wait list. You know, they will take it after the uh, we test the, the families that took it. Of course, the program, the intervention list has improved a lot on the SDQ, uh, you know, um, between pretest and the follow-up period. But I want to draw your attention to the orange line, the waiting list. These are families that were at the baseline told, listen, we being a parent in situation of conflict is a very important thing. And we have this caregiving tool, right? So you will take this program later, but you know, um, and then we but for now we want to test what you know about this. So basically we just articulated the fact to them, telling them that you know, being a good parent in that circumstance of stress is important. That by itself has nudged the scoring that they have rated for their kids between baseline and the follow-up. That tells you in terms of how much sometimes just like that small push for families is useful. Of course, taking a more structured program will help better. And then there's strong family that showed the result, but of course there's a subgroup of families that are exposed to trauma, particularly in that sub-community. And there's a program called TRT Plus that we are trying to, uh, to work with uh, the Children and War Foundation and University of Manchester, moving it from a program that really addresses trauma and children, adding a plus element, plus being plus parenting sessions. So after you address the trauma and child, you readdress the parenting skills uh, with that context. Um, that program um, has been tested as a small trial first in uh, on Syrian refugees in Turkey. But again, we worked together in Lebanon. We had a three-arm clinical trial on Syrian refugee in the West Bekaa Plain. You will see in the photo, Ala Al Khani, Dr. Al Khani is like on Skype actually, training remotely from Manchester because of security reasons, she could not be there. A group of facilitators on these programs. And that program went available to 119 families on a free arm basis. So basically there was a wait list, people that took the RT and people that took the RT plus showed very positive results in terms of improving. You will see the orange line being the RT plus parenting between baseline and uh, the third time of follow-up on uh, one scale is the child rating of impact of event, how much the, the, the impact of event was uh, impact of event scale have improved over time. Also a report of, of uh, anxiety related disorder on the child as well as on the parents over time. Um, and then on many other scales, um, you know, the impact of that scale, even on the on the parents, the depression self-rating scales, all of them from a mental health perspective have as improved. And we are doing the publication. And as we speak right now, um, only last week actually, um, we given the unfortunate incidents that happened in on August 4 in Lebanon, there's a group of um, scouts actually from the Scout Federation being trained on TRT Plus to try to provide this program for the families that were affected by the Beirut blast through our UNODC office in Lebanon. So another program is Family United. That's, as I said, is a universal program. This program is much more, it's like light also, but it's four sessions where in the four session, the entire family come in. I'm not gonna go into its details, 
um, but essentially it works on similar skills but with a bit more time because these families are not living in stressful settings so they have they can come for four uh, um, sessions and then there's a uh, this is the logical framework of how the program operates but that program has been more recently piloted so strong family has a longer history of piloting family united we started getting the result this year it was initially piloted in indonesia and bangladesh and this is the poster that we have prepared on the impact of this program um, um, through a follow-up you see the parenting adjustment and family adjustment scales how they have improved over time the child mental health uh, sdq measures how they have improved over time both in boys and girls pink and probably you cannot see the numbers but that presentation will be given to you you can read them in more details but we added another scale on child resilience how much we have improved the resilience and we see three groups the red groups are the groups the group that had the lowest level of resilience at baseline and you will see that has improved the most which is something we were looking for and that's just a poster we have presented in eu spr in portugal uh, a month ago that is for you you can read it in more details i kept it as a slide for you as for reference we have launched um right now i mean uh, unfortunately for technical reason i can't show you the video but i really strongly invite you to see it it's a beautiful video done by my colleague uh, elizabeth matfield on um the science of affection of family it's a very short clip less than a minute but it really hits the nail in the sense of the value of affection and this is one of a series of 10 videos coming out from a landmark listen first uh, campaign that really focuses on listening to science and and the parents listening to their kids as well it's more on the advocacy level but it is it, it hits very very important messages in terms of in difficult times how much affection can make your child feel stronger and they um, beth made a very nice point in terms of having a description of where the science is in terms of affection and in other sort of domain of parenting that exists. Giovanna mentioned the fact, going back to why individual resilience and family skills can work together, this is a slide where you see um, a control group of kids that have been um, in a community that have high rates of uh, crystal meth use, uh, followed over four years and a half, that's the blue line, and after four years and a half, the level of crystal meth use you know compared to baseline increased by five percent whereas people that took life skills education programs the schools that were randomly assigned for life skills education their level of Kristen matthews four years and a half later was at half the basis the red line represents the subgroup was randomly assigned to take both life skills and family skills and you can appreciate the multiplicative effect of prevention when these two programs work together where the level of um, Kristen matthews is 0.5 I think this complements the same analysis that was done on another study uh, in the US where um, because there was a problem of uh, prescription opioid you will see the different level of um, uh, prescription opioid misuse uh, between the control group versus the group the gray line versus the group that took uh, life skills education school programs uh, only versus the blue group that took a combination of parenting plus uh, life skills education over time to see the multiplicative effect of prevention that happens. We also have a family skills program, a family program where engaging family in the treatment of children that my colleague Anya Bush is working on as well. If you're interested, I put the brochure link there. But you can now appreciate that family skills is not only substance use. There's a multitude of outcomes that can be addressed. Um, violence, physical and mental health, education of the children, Abstinence from risky sexual behavior, not necessarily directly, but that rapport between the parents and children might help facilitate um, difficult discussions on difficult topics as well. Occupational health can improve because if my family function better, I can function better at work. Engagement in community, it moderates poverty. Being poor does not mean you are doomed to have, to, to, to have negative social outcome. If you are poor, while the government is addressing poverty as a, as a systematic issue, you know, having good parenting skill in this context would help the children being protected from the effect of poverty and has generation effect. There are more and more studies that showcase that children that have that are raised by parents that took these parenting and family skills program grow up to be better parents themselves. And that's why Giovanna talked about that minimal approximation of a 10 to 1 uh, return on investment of these programs. 
So these are common denominator to very important uh, strategies. You know, violence, violence extremism, the INSPIRE initiative to end violence against children, where you know he is trying to also support. INSPIRE is an acronym for different uh, strategies, seven strategy. Every single letter of INSPIRE stands for one strategy. And the P of INSPIRE is for parenting as a strategy to prevent violence against children. And you can appreciate that directly from you know, when you improve parenting skills in terms of violence against children, but children also that have good parenting skills grow up to be less violent themselves against other children as well. Youth violence and as well, the WHO um, Helping Adolescent Thrive Initiative to promote positive mental health also talks about uh, prevention. Um, the youth prevention of WHO talk about seven strategies to prevent youth engagement in prevention and in, in, in violence, and you, are, and you appreciate one of the seven strategies as well is family skills. So. They're not only for drug use. We move to the current context of COVID-19. So under COVID-19, there is COVID-19 as a virus, but for us, there's also COVID-19 as a phenomenon. Um, parents now, you know, the virus in terms of its infectivity is stressful, but also the social, the sort of the, um, the social distancing and the other sort of measures that the government, political measures taken by the government is, is also an additional source of stress. Closure of schools, uh, working from home, um, physical distancing, all of these are stressful things. And of course, the aftermath of it from an economic perspective is an additional level of stress. And that's why as UN family in general, the level of violence against children is increasing, which is causing us to focus a lot in that domain. And you will see them in the leaders' call uh, of the partnership to end violence against children. That you know, see is one of the signing. Our uh, executive director is a signing partner on this. The secretary general, uh, special advisor on violence against children, also you see as an eight UN agency um, um, agenda for action that also focuses on uh, violence against children. That talks about the importance of family skills, and also more and more the mental health issue is becoming as, as a hot topic. As you know, see. Under the umbrella of the Listen First, we have developed information for parents to parent under COVID-19, which are very useful small tips. But also we have designed a special leaflet for um, parenting if you are a caregiver in crowded and community settings. And there's a booklet on that goes into more details in terms of how to care for your child under lockdown. All of these are in the link below, and I really invite you to read them as a parent yourself or to give it to other parents as well. Um, these are very useful tips for the unfortunate circumstances that we are living in. They don't require any training, they're self-read, and I hope they will be useful for all of you. This is another poster that we presented in the EU SPR with Manchester University on these tools. Our colleagues from Ending Partnership Against uh, uh, Violence Against Children also have very useful and very important um, Parenting tips that we have, we were fortunate also to support and work with them on. Um, these, uh, every single item that you see in front of you is a leaflet by itself in terms of useful direct tips that you will use in these circumstances available in many languages. I strongly invite you to visit them. Um, you will see the domains are self-explanatory in the sense of what sort of parenting tips um, you could use in different circumstances. They have produced a very nice video called uh, Let's Slow Down, that's in a way digested all these 12 parenting tips that we're talking about. You can see the tube, uh, the, the video also in the uh, link below. I'm, I encourage, actually, they have a kind of a karaoke competition now on um, singing the song together from different countries. You're welcome to join it as well. Uh, we have done uh, practical guidance in terms of how to engage in terms of risk communication in refugee settings with different UN partners. The uh, practical guidance are also listed for your reference in this presentation. And most recently, because of the unfortunate circumstances that happened in Beirut on August 4th, the Beirut blast, um, we adapted uh, one of the caregiving tools that we have to uh, caregiving uh, for children under crisis situation, because unfortunately, it's not only happening in Beirut, but more and more, we find uh, sudden things that are happening where Parenting um, is, is, is diverted into parenting in, in stressful situations that are very sudden. Natural disaster, floods, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, um, where you suddenly use your home, right? So you are challenged immediately to parent in a difficult circumstances. And these are very easy to, to reach um, 
um, to, to access uh, tools, um, it might not be directly, as we speak, available on the um, uh, link that I had for Listen First, but uh, I promise you within a couple of days it might be there. And if you need it more urgently, it's available, but we just didn't upload it yet. It's uh, fresh materials. So I will end at just re-emphasizing the fact that when you think from a program in the perspective of not the problem, not um, you know drug use or, or violence or only the issue, but you're looking at the individual and how you support the individual at different ages of development, whether it's the 17 sustainable development goal or their 160 target, you will start appreciating more and more how much they are interlinked when you have that vision in mind and how much one program can be supporting more than element of work. And this is the core element that we work with under that family skills umbrella. I presented, but um, my work that's being presented is I'm presenting on behalf of a very large team of people that work in, in terms of development, in terms of assessment. I would like to acknowledge um, Professor Virginia Molgard and Dr. Legna Molgard, who helped us a lot on the designing of the parenting skills. Um, parenting, uh, Professor uh, Rachel Callum and Dr. Ala Alkhani from Manchester University, particularly on the work that are uh, parenting in stressful settings. Uh, Dr. Karen Har, Dr. Ziad Khatib, and Ms. Selina Herrera working with us in terms of dissemination and, and assessment of these tools. My UNLC um, PTRS colleagues, I mentioned Beth and Giovanna, but also Nina Fabiola, uh, who's administrating this entire process, and other colleagues within PTRS, our field office colleagues. But also that was an opportunity for us as UN family to work together. Many of the tools, WHO, UNICEF, UNFCR, Partnership for Ending Violence Against Children, and many more, we're working together in terms of disseminating and, and helping these families together. Um, I know that WHO is also doing a campaign as we speak, um, We Are Family, and singing it on song, which I, I really believe that sort of the only positive consequence of COVID-19 is it brought us all closer together. And of course, the donors that support us to have these programs in place, Japan, Family United was initiated because of them, the USINL, Strong Families, but Sweden, Spain, Saudi Arabia, and France have helped us a lot in terms of disseminating these programs. And I'll pass the floor back to you with this presentation. I hope we have more time for questions and answers. Thank you, Wadia, for this insightful uh, webinar. Uh, we received a lot of quest uh, questions. However, we will not be going through all of them. I will try my best to to uh, to ask them as uh, as uh, as much as possible. Okay. So the first question is: um, There is an an increasing concern about violence in many urban and rural rural areas due to political instability. When unsafe conditions threaten treatment options, what approach should caregivers take with families where there may be evidence of extreme violence or even military aggression? Yeah, I mean, as I said, it, it depends on the circumstances where the family is. And that's why it's important that that infrastructure that exists with these families, the tools that I talked about are basic needs if there is no specific intense need. But when we're disseminating these needs, we are, you know, all the infrastructure that exists in terms of disseminating these programs is assessing what exists as an infrastructure in the community that is there and try to advocate at least um, in terms of contact and presence of specific centers that can support while the family skills are being distributed. As I said, we're working more universal mm -hmm. within that selective setting, but uh, but it is it's very important to map out the services because just addressing one need without addressing the, the multitude of needs might be counterproductive for us. And that's why it's it's very situation specific and a mapping out of the services that exist in every single community that we're working in is key. Okay. Uh, how can we encourage parents, especially those in challenged environments, to join seminars or trainings to improve their parenting skills if they are working? Uh, for example, uh, what will I feed my family if I will attend such programs? I would say the person is trying to say what motivation can, yeah. uh, how can you motivate the parents to join these trainings? It's a very key question and we always, when we talk about adaptation, we talk about what's inside the document. But for us, um, adaptation is not only in the content, the adaptation is in the process of delivery. 
So basically, sometimes doing weekdays versus weekends, um, actually, like, you know, reaching out for families through school is, is key because you have the setting and we have the rooms. Mm -hmm. um, um, bringing food to these sessions is an incentive of families to avoid them, you know, making dinners at home. All of these are, and not labeling the program as a program that is tainted for families that are broken families or have a problem. Um, you know, tainting the program, stigmatizing the program is key. There are several variables that encourage the people, the family to come at the first session. That's the challenge, coming to the first session for mm -hmm. a program that has never been introduced to the community. But once you take that first session and appreciate what the program is about, especially if it's entertaining and fun in terms of its design, the children start encouraging the parents to come to the second session and the, th and the third. These are key elements to consider and every different community really needs to assess and evaluate the process of its implementation, what works and what did not work and what can encourage parents to, to move forward again. Okay. Um, the third question is, is it okay for children to find more comfort uh, ra uh, in someone rather uh, other than their parents? Yes, that's key. And because not comfort more than one parents, because um, you know, you you saw me like a lot of time I interchange and use the word parenting, but you know, we have caregiver session. Whoever is the primary caregiver of the child is the person that is key to participate in these programs um, to ensure that the child is getting the support he or she needs. So it does not necessarily in all times mean the biological parents right. of the children. Right. That's that's key. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question. How easy is it for a local NGO to adopt a UNODC approved family based prevention program? This is the first part of the question. Yeah. Well, it depends. Then, uh, there are certain tools that are, uh, as I said, the leaflets, the booklets, these are free and require no training and they don't require even to knock our door. We just appreciate the fact that they will tell us how many distributed and how many they have received, right? So we have no restriction on this. There are programs that just require training and we encourage from an ethical perspective to be trained on that program to ensure that you know the, the way the program is designed is received by the family. But once it's implemented, these are royalty-free programs. So okay. there's no copyright fees. The only requirement is to be formally trained on these programs if, if, if they are structured programs. That's it. And uh, it, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I encourage them, I left my contacts um, slides uh, on my slide whether the email or whether on twitter um, it's depending on the country if the infrastructure exists on the country they can come to us and if that exists i can put them in contact with our colleagues in the office of concern and they might take it uh, they may participate in the training if it's ongoing okay thank you Adia. and the second part of the the same question is uh, do you think that such programs can be delivered by youth for example scouts uh, group uh, or like you gave the example of the Beirut explosion uh, that happened, do you, do, you, do you provide, like can the youth provide such a program? Is there research to investigate whether the age of the facilita facilitators matters for the effect effectiveness of the program with the parents? We strongly encourage youth to be engaged in these programs okay. in terms of their dissemination. But as I said, there are some programs that, you know, for example, the booklet that I talked about, Parenting Under Crisis, yes. this is a self read booklet, right? So the youth have very, it's, anybody can read it. And it actually, the parents can read it and just do it by themselves. But some youth are creative enough to make video clips, do presentations online, YouTube presentation, disseminated through WhatsApp, creative ways of disseminating that information and passing it on. As I said, that these are sort of level of basic needs, the parenting tips that I showed. All of these things, the kids, the youth can be engaged to be part of that dissemination to pass on that knowledge to other families. And we strongly encourage that the kids, the youth, would the youth specifically be engaged in dissemination such scientific material to feel that they are participating in especially under the context of COVID-19 and passing on scientific information because that's also indirectly um, helped them um, in their mental health um, as well feeling productive rather than sharing information that sometimes on social media is, 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 um, is stressful for them and for the recipients. Okay, but of course thank other you. programs require training 
um, you know, as I said, they can be done by lay facilitators. Um, you know, even TRT is something in, as as a program, as um, you know, as as an intervention for trauma. Uh, certain youth can be trained on it as as lay people to pass on that knowledge, but the requirement is training. Okay, uh, Wadia. Now I will move on to the last question. Mm -hmm. Uh, considering the, uh, that there is high level of li illiteracy in regards to alcohol and substance uh, abuse, at least where the person resides at, he didn't, the person who asked this question did not mention where uh, he resides. Uh, hmm. What other options can be put in place to complement efforts and provide literacy to families? I'm a bit confused with the question. You're talking about uh, literacy, literacy or literacy in terms of knowledge about drugs? L literacy in regards to alcohol and substance abuse. Okay. So in terms yeah. of knowledge, well, knowledge about knowledge. drugs. Knowledge, yeah, yeah. You can say, okay. yeah. So yeah, oh, there are, of course, uh, as you know, DC, we have, you know, a lot of on our website in terms of knowing more about the substance that exists. But um, the discussion about specific um, substances would depend on the age and the vulnerability of the, and if we talk about passing in this information, the parents knowing about them, everybody should know about them. But in terms of how to engage uh, with the specific youth, it depends on the risk group and the age group that we're working with, whether or not, uh, but you know, the, the main component is to look for scientific and correct information. I strongly advise to visit the UNODC website on this or WHO uh, website in, in the sense of uh, kind of reliable um, sources of scientific information that might not be biased by other sort of means. Uh, and and but the in the discussion it depends on the vulnerability and the youth um, of concern. So specific age groups could be, for example, let's assume. Uh, substance use is initiated at the age of 15 in a certain community. Um, so 15 year old should be aware and literate in terms of what the drugs are from reliable sources. But uh, probably in that same community, you know, engaging in that discussion with a 12 year old might, or an 11 year old might be a bit more challenging. So um, so it's better for whenever the vulnerability age is, is assessed as, as an age of um, usual onset of the, of, of, of the country of concern, to, to engage, uh, to, to allow the child to, to learn more about the substance and, and move uh, forward with it. Um, Giovanna mentioned a very important slide, particularly when it comes to um, sensitivity, because there's two things. There is the element that is um, perception of harm of the substance, uh, which is knowledge-based, but there's also another element, which is, I think Peer talked about it, which is the normative belief of the substance. So basically, there are certain kids, not necessarily the the, uh, the chemical content of the substance or its effect of the body is is the uh, illiteracy part, right? But for example, the fact that you know an assumption is that in an age that age group everybody uses it. Let's assume it's cigarettes or it's marijuana or it's any other substance. So there could be the absence of knowledge in terms of what the substance is and its health effects, or it could be from the perspective that you know. Listen, I'm 13 years old. I'm looking at the 15-year-old kids that are in front of me. None of them is offering me the substance, but it's my normative belief that you know everybody that's 15 is smoking, right? So that by itself is 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 something that is also a knowledge thing in the ages of development that needs to be addressed in order to ensure that this risk is not there. It's not only the knowledge of the substance, but there's knowledge is knowledge in terms of its entire epidemiology is is important in specific ages. Okay, we're, we reached the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you again, Wadiya, for joining us today. And thank you, ISAP Global Team, for always supporting us. Uh, we, I would like to mention that the recording and the presentation will be available on ISAP, uh, web, uh, ISAP's website. Uh, for our professionals in the drug use prevention field in Lebanon, please apply for free membership on ISIP's website to stay updated with the latest information and follow us on our social media platforms to learn more about our uh, future activities. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Olivia, Joanna, Olivia, Noor, Turaya, Bshara, Anthony, everybody, and all the attendees. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Olivia. Bye.